great next speaker, Mark Kronfelder, uh, who is the uh, has many hats on, none on at the moment, but he uh, he is the editor of Make Magazine and uh, the uh, co-founder of Boing Boing Blog, and uh, he's also um, just written a book called Made by Him, which I believe he's going to be talking about today. So um, we're going to try and get his. Uh, this presentation up on the laptop. Mark, why don't you come on out and introduce yourself and uh, we'll get going. Please come in, there's plenty of seats. Hi, sorry for the delay, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Rauenfelder, and I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of Make Magazine. And uh, I'm really glad to be here in Detroit. Uh, uh, really excited meeting uh, people in the area who are makers and interested in making. It's been a, a real thrill. Uh, we've been having Maker Fair now uh, for five years. We've had five of them in San Mateo, a couple of them in Austin. And uh, it's really great to see fresh faces and new ideas and things like that. So I, I, uh, I've made a lot of connections with people and I, I hope to meet, make more. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is a book that uh, I wrote recently. It just came out. It's called uh, Made by Hand, Searching for Meaning in a Throwaway World. And what it's about is my uh, kind of adventures in the do-it-yourself world. Uh, to be honest, when I first started uh, editing Make Magazine, I really wasn't much of a DIYer or a maker in terms of things in the physical world. I had been interested in doing things with zines and online design and blogs. I started a blog called boingboing.net. Um, uh, but after hanging out with these people who are uh, the, the contributors of Make Magazine and seeing how much joy and satisfaction they had out of making things and living with the things that they made, uh, I found it to be really uh, infectious and inspiring. And, and I wanted to uh, kind of incorporate more do-it-yourself in my own life. So this book is about uh, my experiences. And, and one of the big things that I worked on in the book was uh, uh, kind of what I call urban homesteading. Uh, you know, producing and uh, uh, preserving my own food. Uh, and, and kind of the, th the things that are, are related to that. And one of the reasons that I chose uh, that as, as a project or a theme of the projects was because uh, food is something that everybody does, everybody eats. Uh, and the more you get involved with the, the production, uh, creation and preservation of your food, the, the closer you are to it, the more you appreciate it, and uh, the more the people in your family and even your community can become involved. So. Uh, uh, what I decided to do was uh, uh, start doing some research and, and looking for people who were, who were doing that kind of thing already, who were kind of urban homesteaders. So uh, uh, one of the uh, first people I, I met up with are uh, uh, Eric Knudsen and Kelly Coyne. They live in a, an area of Los Angeles called Silver Lake. 
very close to downtown. They have a small house there with a small yard. It's probably uh, under a quarter acre. But they produce a lot of their own food on this little plot of land. And they come up with some pretty cool ways of doing that. Uh, they're also authors of a book called The Urban Homestead that I really highly recommend. It uh, uh, tells you how to do everything from doing raised bed vegetable gardening to raising chickens to keeping bees, uh, composting, making worm composting. Uh, and they also have a blog called homegrownevolution.com where they talk about the things that they've learned and uh, uh, the kinds of plants that they grow and, and things like that. So uh, I took a little tour of their backyard and I, I saw things like their raised bed garden system. Uh, they use uh, embedded drip systems on timers so that the water is delivered to the raised beds uh, and the water, it, the, these little uh, drip systems are very close to the ground and under the mulch so that there's not a lot of evaporation or waste uh, and the water's on a timer so if they're out of town for a while they don't have to worry about the, the uh, vegetables uh, the vegetable plants drying up. They use a lot of mulch. Mulch is really good as a way to uh, uh, keep the, the uh, soil uh, from drying up. Uh, it keeps weeds from growing. Uh, it helps to some degree with, uh, with insect pests. They also make uh, self-watering containers uh, and they make them out of these plastic bins. And what, what those are, are uh, you can see here that uh, the kind of covering. Uh, you, you fill these bins with water and, and water sits in a reservoir below and is wicked up through a kind of a soil column to the rest of the soil uh, so that you don't have to water the containers every single day. They, they're an excellent way to uh, grow your own vegetables if you live in a city or even an apartment. You can put these on a balcony. You don't have to worry about watering them every day or in some cases, you know, when, when the weather's really hot, well, watering them more than once a day. Here's how Eric makes his self-watering garden containers. You can also buy them from a place called earthboxes.com ready-made. Um, it just depends on, on what you want to do. Another thing they made were these rockets. Uh, they made a rocket stove, which is uh, a uh, cool stove that was, uh, was uh, developed to, to uh, be used in areas where lumber uh, or, or uh, large pieces of wood fuel were scarce, where, uh, but were twigs were abundant and it makes very efficient use of, the, of twigs uh, that you can just pick up off the ground through foraging and the heat uh, shoots up a little chimney the way it's designed and delivers a lot of heat so they often would cook their meals just in the backyard using a rocket stove. They also use solar cookers to cook their, uh, cook their food. They kind of work like a slow cooker. You just uh, put some potatoes, chicken or beef or something in a pot and just let it cook all day long. Uh, if you're interested in solar cooking, here's a great website that has a lot of plans. In a recent issue of Make Magazine, we uh, show how to make a solar cooker that actually rotates to follow the sun um, so that you get the maximum heat throughout the day. And it, it uses a pretty cool uh, way to do that. They made a food dehydrator. Uh, what happens with this is this is a long uh, uh, kind of channel. And as the cooler air below rises up, uh, it's heated and gets hotter and hotter and it goes through this, this part here and uh, there's a series of trays like screens basically where you have cut up pieces of dried food, fruit, things like that, uh, vegetables and it, it dries it up nicely so that you can preserve uh, uh, the, the food that you, you don't eat in the summer and then you can eat it later on. They also uh, use their parkways to uh, grow vegetables. This is an illegal parkway garden because you're not really supposed to do that in Los Angeles, but they did it anyway. And it's, you know, it's pretty attractive, actually. It looks nice. It's, uh, to me, comparable to a, uh, a flower bed, except you can eat the food there. So uh, here's what I took away from, from Eric and Kelly. Grow only useful things. So they, uh, they steer away from decorative plants, unless there's also a, a, another purpose for it, either medicinal or for, for food, uh, or for fuel, or for food for their chickens, or something like that. Region matters a lot, so they really thought a lot about LA's climate, which is not really a desert like a lot of people think. It's a Mediterranean climate, so they they grow plants that are, are uh, traditionally found in Mediterranean climates. Build your soil—that means through composting or worm permaculture. 
water deeply and less frequently to prevent uh, weeds from, from proliferating. Work makes work. That means work with your environment. Uh, don't work against it uh, because then you're, you're setting yourself up for a struggle that never stops and you might abandon the project through discouragement. Uh, failure is part of the game. You are going to make a lot of mistakes. And that was a big thing I wrote about in the book was, was uh, getting used to the idea that you are going to make a lot of mistakes and to consider that to be part of the game and to actually think of it as a positive part of the game because you're learning while you're doing that. Sometimes by making mistakes, you can actually uh, come up with a more creative and, and better solution than what you had anticipated. Pay attention and keep notes. So here's another couple that I met. They're in uh, Northern California, Sebastopol, California. It's actually the same town where Make Magazine is published. It's uh, about an hour and a half north of San Francisco. Uh, Julian Darley and Celine Rich. Uh, it's actually Celine, I, I did a typo there. Um, they are the founders of the Post Carbon Institute, which is an organization that is investigating how people might live in a future where uh, liquid fuels are, are very precious and very rare. Uh, how can we survive uh, and, and even thrive in a world where we don't have an abundance of cheap gasoline and cheap fuel? So they were uh, ex big time experimenters. They had uh, solar panels. Uh, they even had a couple of pickup trucks that uh, were charged with solar panels and they uh, were renting them out and they were working with alternative currency schemes where uh, people could trade uh, solars instead of dollars that represented units of solar energy and they could do things like buy uh, uh, vegetables and other uh, locally produced goods from each other. They did self-watering container systems uh, and little aqueducts that ran all through their yard. Here's a picture of their yard or some of the tools that they use. Uh, just uh, have a few shots to show you the variety and abundance of, of uh, vegetables that they grew. Uh, they had a lot of melons, uh, garlic, they were working on a lot of beans and, and seeds. Maize, there's some raspberries. Uh, they even had grains, a lot of root vegetables. So you can see they just had tons and tons of stuff. Uh, their place was about, I think it was a third of an acre but they made a lot more food than they could actually eat, which was kind of cool. Um, everything that they did, they entered into an energy equation. Uh, they wanted to see how much energy they could get out of an investment of energy. So for, uh, they figured out that chickens were really good energy producers. Uh, you give a chicken about 200 calories a day, and it will produce 100 calories in the form of, of one egg a day. Now, that, that's 50% efficiency. That doesn't sound that great, but really, the chickens are eating uh, calories that humans can't consume. So they're taking unusable calories and turning them into usable calories. Uh, so what did they do with the food that they, they couldn't uh, eat themselves? They started the UPIC program and invited neighbors to come over and pick uh, vegetables out of their garden, collect the eggs, and then weigh them on a scale, and, uh, and put money in a little box that sat there on the counter. And uh, it turned out to be a really great program because it got a lot of people interested in the garden, and their neighbors started gardening and doing the same thing. They looked at tools. Uh, you know, modern agriculture uses lots of tools that are powered by gasoline. Uh, in a post-carbon world, there won't be that kind of gasoline, so you have to look at either uh, human power, animal power, uh, solar, wind, uh, things like that. They made a cider press, um, and you can see here, here's the roller, you throw the apples in there, and those, uh, those screws there help tear the apples up. They uh, weren't very successful with that, and they weren't very successful with this wind-powered experiment either. Um, they found out that they could injured themselves pretty easily using human-powered implements. Um, and, uh, you know, they were realistic about it. They, they're saying it's not easy to, uh, to, to survive in a world without, without liquid fuel. And uh, they're realistic about it. So they're still looking for answers about ways to make these kinds of things work. They had a big problem with gophers. Uh, 
Uh, you can see that melon down there where a gopher just bored right through it. In the upper right-hand corner, that was a plastic bag that was being kept in a, uh, a uh, water uh, distribution control box and the instruction manual was in there. The gopher decided to have a sample of the instruction manual to see if it was tasty and destroyed that. Um, this is a little spike that uh, you pound into the ground. It's battery powered and it emits a chirping sound that sounds kind of like a smoke alarm every uh, 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 you know, 15 minutes or so. It works to keep the gophers out, but uh, they, they found that every one of them they tried to break after a week or so because of moisture. Um, another thing they wanted to look at was, well, maybe we could produce uh, some oil uh, locally. That would be a great thing if you could grow uh, canola seeds or things like that and, and press it by, uh, you know, with a, with a hand press and produce your own oil because that's a very calorie dense source of energy. But uh, they had a hard time. Those things there, those are, that's what a canola seed looks like. Look how little it is and it's really hard. Um, it's surprising. You know, I, I never knew it, what a canola seed looks like, looked like, but it's just that little tiny thing and it takes a tremendous amount of energy to squeeze that oil out of it. So that's not really a practical solution in a localized uh, economy. One thing that they did have uh, uh, some pretty good success with was sorghum. They uh, devoted about 200 square feet of their property to sorghum and they uh, they pressed it here. You can see this. Uh, this is a hundred-year-old sorghum press, and the instructions for using it are, print, are cast right into the cast iron. Um, you put the sorghum stalks in there. It kind of looks like sugar cane, and then people walk around uh, uh, pushing a, a big wooden beam that turns the uh, turns the mechanism that squeezes the juice out of the sorghum. So they figured that, uh, according to their equations you can get about 20 gallons of pure alcohol from one acre of sorghum. So that just shows you, uh, you know, you need quite a bit of land just to get 20 gallons of uh, fuel that is not even as energy rich as gasoline. They worked with stills, that was what they were doing with the apple cider. Um, so here's the lessons that, uh, that I learned from uh, Julie and Celine. Try lots of little things before you commit. Experiment, see what works for you. Uh, one gallon of gasoline equals about five weeks of hard human labor. Uh, you shouldn't really hate liquid fuel and complain about gasoline, think gasoline is the enemy. Instead, you should treat it as something very precious. Uh, don't be wasteful with it. Uh, conservation can go a long way in keeping, uh, preventing people, you know, our, our planet from running out of liquid fuel. We can make much better use of it than, we're, than we are right now. Life in a post-carbon world isn't going to be easy, and go for suck. <laughs> Another couple I met uh, were Eric Thomason and Julia Posey. They live in Los Angeles also, and uh, they uh, run a website called Ramshackle Solid, which is also the name of their uh, uh, place that they have in Los Angeles. They have a really great uh, blog called RamshackleSolid.com. On the right there are some of the subjects that they talk about. I'm sorry that the formatting got a little messed up because I wrote this in Keynote and it's in PowerPoint. But uh, you can get an idea about the different things that they're, that they're talking about. Uh, uh, they're interested in educating their children, they're interested in making their own clothes, their own shelters, uh, their own food, uh, their own furniture. And here you can see their, their property is really indeed ramshackle. They live uh, in, in the hills of Los Angeles in an old uh, hunting lodge that was used by hunters to hunt for grizzly bear when grizzly bear used to be uh, running around Los Angeles a long time ago. Um, there's a bean pole that Derek grew. He's got a mulcher that uh, he bought this mulcher at a garage sale, so uh, the whole property is covered in mulch now. They, they use this tent uh, to live basically spending all, all day they take all their meals in this tent. You can raise and lower the flaps uh, according to the weather. It was a really nice place to hang out. This is a little outdoor living area that they created with a fire pit. There's a beam pole that Eric made out of rebar. Uh, um, this was a, a cool shack that I uh, introduced Eric to uh, just through photos. It was in uh, Architectural Digest magazine. This architect named Jeffrey Broadhurst built this little 
shack in uh, West Virginia that has, a, that has a big door that opens so he can overlook that valley. And Eric was really inspired by that and decided to uh, use that as a basis for making a, uh, a shack of his own that you can see on this property. There's my daughter standing there. Um, and so he calls it the ramshackle shack. And uh, this was an interesting thing that he said. Uh, at first we thought about renting a studio, but at a cost of at least $500 a month here in LA, that didn't make sense. We were able to build this shack's shack style studio for about half the annual cost of renting, plus about 10 full days of labor spread over two months for me and a friend. And so it's really an attractive structure and it's a permanent structure. Now he doesn't have to commute to a studio and uh, he's got this uh, great addition. Uh, and they're really into reusing things that they find, so this is his laptop desk, just a cast off piece of wood that he found. Um, they have little kids, so uh, he made this, what he calls a compostable child safety lock. And uh, basically the deal is it's just too hard for the kid to figure out how to open. Um, and you know, it is kind of a fun thing to have around the house, you notice it, you see it, and uh, compare that kind of safety lock with something like that, that's just so, so boring. And uh, the other one, is, you know, that's kind of a conversation stopper, the other one's a conversation starter. And using these little kind of glass jars like that, I was impressed by how attractive that is compared to, uh, you know, the typical way that people will store food, something like that. So what did I learn from Eric and Julia? Keep it simple, small victories add up. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. So uh, arming myself with this kind of information, one of the, uh, I started to work on my own property. And one of the things that I wanted to do was kill my lawn uh, so that I could use that land to start growing my own vegetables. So I uh, hired a, a truck to deliver mulch, and this is what 15 cubic yards of mulch looks like. There's the lawn before. First I, I covered the uh, graft with gypsum to kind of get the process started. Uh, I got some vinegar and uh, drenched the lawn in vinegar to help kill the grass. And then we covered up the lawn with uh, cardboard and newspaper. And the idea was that we were going to smother the uh, lawn. Oh yeah, the, what I did first of all though was I, I really soaked the lawn really well so that it was like you know, six inches of water and that way uh, then I covered it up so the idea is that you would germinate all of the, the seeds, like the weed seeds, the grass seeds or whatever, and then uh, they would, would, you know, as soon as they would grow, they would get no sunlight and would die. So here we are covering it up, my wife pitched in, uh, I would, uh, we'd have to wet the newspaper down a little to keep it from blowing around, but we would, you know, it took a while to do, but eventually this is what we ended up with, which was kind of like our platform or substrate for growing vegetables and other things. So then uh, it was time to start working on and growing plants and uh, I got these little seed starter kits uh, to germinate the seeds and I started germinating them inside. But the problem was that the fluorescent light that I was using wasn't strong enough. And so these plants are really long and spindly and very thin stemmed because they're trying as hard as they can to get to uh, maximize the amount of uh, light hitting them for photosynthesis. And that's a bad thing to have the plants growing skinny like that because they will collapse on themselves and kink up like a garden hose. And so this is what light starved plants look, looks like. Um, this guy that I know named Mikey Sklar actually has addressed this problem by building an LED array of mostly red LEDs and some blue LEDs and blinking them in a certain pattern. And uh, here's his description of uh, making a little a one watt uh, LED array to grow a, a, a six by six array. And here you can see his are uh, uh, much uh, sturdier looking. So that's something I wanted to experiment with. But you know, some, some of the uh, seeds actually started to work and so my daughter and I started working on, on planting the ones that made it and we ended up getting some pretty good uh, produce that year. And then uh, we wanted to experiment with the preservation methods, so we, we dehydrated the food. Um, 
Uh, and now I'm going to just backtrack a little bit. Uh, in 2003, my family and I moved to an island in the South Pacific called Rarotonga, and we wanted to uh, kind of slow down a little bit and, and see if we could get more involved with, uh, with the uh, things in our life that kept us alive and well. And uh, one of the things we had growing in our yard were, were a lot of coconut trees, and the coconuts would hit the ground. I had no idea how to open them. I was trying to smash them with a hammer and, uh, or you know, rocks, and, and uh, some, some neighbors took pity on me and, and uh, lent me a uh, coconut scraping bench to, uh, and then she showed me how to use a, a machete to, to open up the coconuts and how to husk the coconuts. So here's my daughter processing coconuts by sitting on the little coconut scraping bench. And it turned out that Coconut Day was uh, really a fun activity. We would do it a couple of times a week and it would be, you know, a, a several hour activity where we would process these coconuts and make coconut scones and pancakes, uh, coconut cream for the fish that we bought. It was really a lot of fun and it encouraged us to try other things. Like we started making our own pasta and tortillas and things like the food that we couldn't buy on the island because it was unavailable. And we really learned how to slow down and become more uh, we become more involved with our own food production. It was really a fun way to live and, and we wanted to, to uh, bring that back with us when we came back to the United States. So here's some of our dehydrated vegetables. I learned how to dry the persimmons in our, uh, growing in our yard this Japanese way where you peel them and hang them on strings. I used to hate the persimmons because uh, they were either really ho horrible tasting, they make, they really make my mouth pucker, or uh, they would get really slimy, and I would, they'd fall on the ground and I would slip on them. But uh, once I learned how to preserve them this way, I really like them. They're, they're delicious. They're like, uh, kind of like dried like candy. I learned how to make sauerkraut, which is uh, ridiculously easy, and it's a lot of fun to make. The only two ingredients are cabbage and salt. That's all you need. Um, I had been buying cabbage at the grocery store uh, for like, Five dollars a quart for for uh, cabbage that had uh, not been completely pasteurized because I like uh, it to have some bioactivity. So you just chop up the cabbage, cover it up, put a rock on it, and then in, uh, in about a week you get this really tasty tangy sauerkraut. And I, I'm addicted to it now, and I, I have it every day. Uh, I started using something called the Picklemeister that has this little uh, air trap to keep. Uh, Bad, bad, uh, bad mold from getting into the, the cabbage because I've had some problems with mold, but this seems to have uh, cured that problem. Started making my own yogurt. Again, that's really easy. You can save a ton of money making your own yogurt. It's about one fourth the price of uh, buying prepared yogurt. Uh, another thing that I did was uh, worked on because I drink espresso uh, like three times a day, I decided that I wanted to get really good at it. And so I took my existing espresso machine and added a temperature control system to it to really lock in the temperature because uh, temperature variation uh, is one of, the, one of the hardest things to control in making espresso. And it also makes the biggest amount of difference in the, the quality of the coffee. Um, if you want to uh, have great espresso, you really want to get that temperature to vary only about one degree. But uh, the espresso machine that I had had a variation of like 40, a 40 degree swing. So I got this uh, kit called a PID controller. And uh, there's the relay for it. I opened up my espresso machine. They had great instructions, so it was easy to uh, put together. And uh, there on the left, upper left, is the little temperature controller. You can see on the right is the desired set temperature, and on the left is where the actual temperature is of the outside of the boiler and it locked in the temperature. It, the variation is like less than one degree. Uh, and uh, this is the portafilter of the espresso machine and I removed these spigots so that I could see the espresso coming out directly. I wanted to see the color of the espresso so that I could have more control over how long the water was coming out. And uh, there's uh, what the uh, espresso looks like. That's not a, actually mine. That's from a website that publishes pictures of espresso coming out. It's called Espresso Porn. Dot blogspot.com. There's some uh, real espresso freaks out there. I'm running out of time, so uh, I am going to have to cut this short. Uh, sorry, I took a little bit longer, but I, I uh, raised chickens, uh, converted an old shack that we had into a uh, into a chicken coop, and uh, 
we uh, named our chickens using colored tie straps. And uh, it ended up being great. Uh, chickens turned out to be good for fertilizer, uh, great for pest control. They ate all of our black widows. Uh, they ate a lot of our scraps, turned our kitchen uh, table scraps into eggs. Uh, and they were just a lot of fun, too. So I have more here, but uh, I'm going to cut short. Uh, my book is actually being sold in the maker shit here today if you're interested in it. And I go into much more detail into all the things in here. A lot of other things like uh, making musical instruments, uh, carving wooden spoons, uh, educating my children, uh, uh, and some other things along those lines. So thanks a lot for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>